mtenzi anodana bacheki wake kure ne pecho mafunde aiva aiva kutia pinzwe mudura swende swende za swende za musi takuta Allow me to take this time and greet all of you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, it is good to be in the house of the Lord, and I hope that this is one of the things that you um, look forward to during this camp meeting, uh, to be in the house of the Lord, to come and be blessed with such melody and such music. Um, I want to thank you, gentlemen and ladies, um, for the music service that you rendered um, this evening. Um, one of the things that I am praying for, um, I don't know about you, I don't know uh, what you, your plan is for heaven, but I have a plan um, for heaven so that when we get there, uh, I am not bored. Yeah, I, I won't be bored. Okay, let me make a let me make a deal with with you. Uh, when we get to heaven, uh, please behave, guys. Ne? Uh, please please behave when we get to heaven. I know that others uh, are looking forward to having wings and flying around. I don't think it's biblical that we'll be having wings. By the way. Um, but I am told uh, from the reading of the Spirit of Prophecy in the Bible that there will be a lot of activity taking place in heaven. Uh, all kinds of things. Uh, there are others who are going to heaven for food um, because of that tree that has 12 different uh, kinds of fruit. Uh, there are others who are looking forward to, uh, to the river. Uh, I am told according to the book of Revelation that the river uh, begins from the throne of God and moves towards the city of Jerusalem and meanders throughout the entire city. And somewhere along the way, as you follow that river, there is a tree that stands like a man. And on that tree, there are fruits that are growing there. Uh, I remember one songwriter says, So, 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 eh? so, 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 not That one is very Adventist. Let's leave that one. I think it was a secular song. Anyways, I'm glad the Holy Spirit uh, did not remind me of that song. 
Uh, but there are some, I know, some of us will be found under that tree. That's not the only thing that you can do when you get to heaven. There are other things. Others, we want to meet uh, some Bible characters in the Bible. Uh, we want to have a chat with them, right? Uh, I don't know who you want to meet when you get to heaven. Um, but uh, some of us are looking forward to, to meeting some of the people. Now, here's what I want to do when I get to heaven, uh, which I can't do on this side of heaven. I can't do what you do. I can't sing. I don't know how to sing. Uh, it's fine, right? Yeah, you can't do everything. It's okay. Uh, I do congregational singing. That's what I do. Uh, but the choristers must start singing. Then the congregation sings. Then I join in. Right? Then I join in. But I stop before everybody else stops. Yeah, I don't want to embarrass myself. I do not know how to sing. But when we get to heaven... I want to ask the Lord to give me a chance to sing. That's what I want to do. And if I sing badly, it's fine. I'll be doing it in heaven anyways. Uh, but I want to sing a song, uh, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. That's the song that I want to sing when you get to heaven. So please, be busy with other things. Ne? But I want to sing for Jesus, not for you. For Jesus, right? So be busy. Meet Peter, James, you know, eh, 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 eh. Who's that, uh, the, the, um, the, not the Queen of Sheba? Go and meet those people. Talk to them. Uh, meet Esther and the others. But give me a chance with Jesus, guys. Just five minutes. Can we, can we agree? Five minutes. We can't, we can't all want to see Jesus. Like, look how many we are. All of us, we want to all see him and have a chat. That's, that's not possible. That's not possible. So, can we agree? Can I see those who agree with Fundis? Five minutes, that's all you'll have in heaven. Can I just see? Those who want to be in agreement. At the rest of you, the race is on. We'll, we'll, we'll see who makes it. We'll see who makes it first. But I'm so glad to be here this evening. And we want to thank the Lord uh, for the privilege of worship. Uh, whenever you get a chance to worship the Lord, please worship with all your heart and soul. Um, it is a good thing for us to worship as we prepare for heaven. But before we get to heaven, we are still on this side of heaven. Uh, there are some things that we need to, uh, we need to get uh, busy with. And I'd like to invite your attention for our devotion this evening um, to 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18. I want to thank um, Pastor Laven for being here this evening. Um, it is truly an, an honor to, to have you in our midst. I believe the church is blessed. Um, to have him here. What does the church say to welcome the pastor? Amen. Thank you very much. Um, it, we've had a good day today um, with him, and I thank the Lord um, that we can sit at his feet and learn a few things. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 18, and I would like us to read verses 20 and 21, but I would like us to read 20b. Not, not the first portion, the second half of that, of that verse. So 20b, and then uh, we also read verse 21. If you found it, please say amen. amen. Yeah, mine starts with three dots. It's not your version. And this is how it reads. But you will not carry any news today because the king's son is dead. And then Job said to the Cushite, Go tell the king what you have seen. May God bless the reading of the word. Amen. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the reading of your word. And we wish to ask that the Holy Spirit that we've been calling upon during our song service can tabernacle with us now, even as the word is opened. This word is infused with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I know, dear God, that when you begin to move, you can also move some hearts this evening. It is my prayer, dear God, that as we read, our Father in heaven, speak to someone who is here in Christ's name. Amen. I'm not an Old Testament uh, preacher, uh, but something happened to me when I got uh, here at camp meeting. All of a sudden, I am attracted towards the, the Old Testament um, I am more into the, into the New Testament um, where I am studying my, my area of speciality, 
uh, is mostly found in the New Testament, which has to do with Christ. Um, I'm in a space that may not be relevant to anybody. Um, I mean, you know, you know how there are people amongst us, there are those who are more practical, there are those who are more rational, right? You're right? Maybe you don't know as yet, right? But maybe discover that, try and find that about yourself. Are you more pragmatic or are you more rational, right? There are some people who, who do not like being trapped in their minds, and all that they do is think, 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 think. People who are trapped in their minds, they delay meetings. They have too many ideas. They are always thinking. They are the people that are always calling for meetings to discuss. And when they get there to discuss, they have other ideas they want to share with everyone. And when their ideas are not bought, they want to force everybody to buy their ideas. Those are ideal people. Then there are practical people who don't have time. Uh, for all that long, rational thinking, they are more practical, right? So I'm, I'm not the practical one. I'm this side. Uh, I, I live most of the time in my own, in my own mind. Um, but please, don't, don't be that. It's boring to be that kind of a person. Um, but nevertheless, the reason why I'm telling you that um, is, to, is to draw your attention this evening to say that there are some few things that we will discuss this evening that needs you to kind of increase the volume of your mind once again. I promise you, I will not torture you like yesterday. All right, just one more time. Uh, let's, let's think a little bit. Uh, we will start celebrating and doing nar other narratives tomorrow. Um, but let us think together um, from this passage of scripture. Allow me to give you a short background to this particular text that we read. I'm going to read it yet again. It says here, uh, but you will carry no news today because the king's son is dead. Then Job said to a Cushite, go tell the king what you have seen. The background to this text is that um, there is a king in Israel, and uh, uh, as, you would, as you would know, uh, God was ruling over the Israelites because he is God. Um, he, had given them, he had given them what is known as a theocracy, which means that it is God that is their king. He is their king. He's their ruler. He's everything to them. Whatever that they need, they need to consult from God. Are we still together? When you read from the book of Genesis all the way into the history of the Israelites, you find that they live under a theocracy and they are ruled by, by God. But I'm told by the Bible that over time, the Bible says that they started looking at other nations and desire to have a king ruling over them. They wanted to be like other nations. And you'd remember that um, God visited the men, um, um, Samuel, and told Samuel that give them a king because they want a king. Do you remember that part, right? Yeah, for, those, for the benefit of those who don't remember, uh, the first king of Israel was then Saul. Uh, Saul became king over the Israelites, but Saul abused the Israelites. Under his kingdom, under his rulership, the Israelites were abused. And as such, the Bible tells us that Saul did not know it, but the spirit of the Lord departed from him. Might I just pause there for a moment and ask you, as a young person listening this evening, do you know whether the Holy Spirit is with you or not? It is critical for you while you are going to church, while you are participating in worship, while you are participating in activities of the church, while you attend concerts and camp meetings to know whether you are with the Lord or not. You cannot continue living life without knowing whether you are in the presence of God or not. Merely attending a program does not guarantee that you are with God. It merely registers the register that you are in attendance, but it does not mean that you are with God. And the Bible says that Saul did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Can you imagine living your life, going to work, going to church, doing everything, telling others how you are saved, yet you don't know whether the Spirit of the Lord has departed from you or is still with you? So the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord departed from him while he is king. And while, when the Holy Spirit departed from him, God says to Samuel, I have already chosen another king for myself. And that king in, was the man David. He became the king over, over Israel. Are we still together? Are we still together? All right. Thank you very much. 
while David is king over Israel, um, you can go and read it in the Old Testament. Uh, something happens in his rulership, and David has, has kids. I think some of you remember uh, he had his, his first wife, and he had a child with uh, the wife. And we are told by the Bible that uh, it was time for the men to go to war, and David decided that he's not going to war. Um, and he decided to remain behind while other men went to war. If you read the Old Testament, you'll find a lot that David, most of the time when the armies of Israel go to war, he must find an excuse to remain behind. Even in this very particular narrative, David finds an excuse to stay behind while other people are going to war. You remember the story. He remained behind, and the Bible tells us one morning he was on his balcony, perhaps having that English breakfast um, with orange juice and guava juice, not mimosas, forget that. We don't do that in the church. Um, and I'm glad you don't know what mimosa is. If you know what mimosa is, stay behind after church. We need to pray for you. Um, but he was having one of those morning breakfasts that, um, that he was having. And while he's busy with, with breakfast, we are told that in the morning there was a lady that was taking a bath. And the Bible tells us that David then begins to have a roving eye. Hey, be careful of roving eyes. A roving eyes are not eyes that remain still. When she passes, they pass and they come back. That is a roving eye. It cannot stand still. It's always moving. That is why when Jesus comes in the New Testament, he raises the standard of morality and says it is not the act that is a sin. It is even when you begin to imagine in your own mind that creates the sin. Let's leave that part. That's not where the sermon is. And so David has sons, as we would know, and, and like, like salt on a, on a fresh wound, the Bible keeps rubbing it in that uh, David got himself involved with Uriah's wife. Even in the New Testament, when David is no longer there, it does not call her Bathsheba, it calls her Uriah's wife. Because she remained Uriah's wife, and even after Uriah had died, she was still Uriah's wife. Even after David married her, the Bible kept calling her Uriah's wife. Let's leave it there. Uh, back at home, there's something that we call istina, ne? You know a brick. Yeah, there's a euphemism we use back at home. Uh, when a guy meets another lady who already has a guy, and you take that lady, umshayeng istina. That is exactly what David did to Uriah, umshayeng istina. But the Bible never forgets. Let me just add a footnote for relationships. I don't want to talk about the relationships this evening. But it's, my, it's a subject of interest. But might I remind you, brother and sister, that when you take someone else's partner, do not cry tomorrow when they take your partner. You have no moral right to take someone's partner, then complain tomorrow that they are cheating on you. Because you would have, they would have learned to cheat with you. Because you took them when you knew that they were with someone. Ah, don't worry. That's not the same one. I'm just passing by. Ne? Just passing by. David decides to have a number of children. He has a number of sons. And the Bible tells us that because David had a number of sons, uh, some, of, so, some of David's sons, uh, the Bible gives us descriptions of them. You would remember one of his sons was Solomon. The Bible says that he was the wisest man in all of Israel. The wisest man in the entire world, not just in Israel, in the entire world. When you read the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, you can tell that this man was an intelligent man. Not only was he smart, but he was also wise. Those are not, that's not the only son of David. You meet other sons of David like Amnon. You meet other sons of David. There's this particular son we are interested in this evening. His name is Absalom. The Bible tells us that in all of Israel, comparatively between males and females, Absalom stood tall above all men with broad shoulders, had the longest hair, far more beautiful than all the hair of all the women in Israel. Can you imagine being a man having beautiful hair, far more beautiful than everyone else? I know that we live in a culture that sells synthetic hair. You know synthetic hair, right? There are all kinds of hair. Um, Ladies, let me, not, let me not disturb your peace. We are here for the Lord. Um, um, the Bible says that he was, actually the Bible gives us a word. It actually says, it does not say that he was a handsome man. It says that he was a beautiful man. 
That is the kind of beauty that Absalom had. Absalom had so much beauty. It was like he was bathing in milk, not with water. He was a he was a beautiful man with beautiful hair, and he had features that stood out far better than the features of everyone else. Are we still following? Can I just highlight to you that some of the gifts that you have are meant to be used for the Lord. They are not gifts that are used for self-gratification and self-branding. They are resources that ought to be brought back to the church so that they can be used for the accomplishment of the mission of the Lord. I, it does not matter whether that is beauty, whether that is being handsome, whether that is being buff, whether that is having money, whether that is having ideas and intellect, it does not matter. Whatever resources that you have are meant for the mission of the Lord. Please say amen. amen. The Bible does tell us that Absalom did not use his gifts for the mission of the Lord, but he used it for his own self gratification. I wish I had time. I was just going to pitch a tent there and talk about him and Amnon and Tamar, and what really took place that evening. Now let's leave that for another time. We can talk about what really took place that evening. I know we, we, we talk, we, oh yeah, it's, 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 it's fine. I'm going to run out of time. So the Bible tells us that there's a battle, then there's a war that ensues between David and Absalom. I'm, I'm rushing the story. It's a long story. There's a war that ensues. There's a battle that ensues between Absalom and David. And the Bible says that Absalom then wanted to take over the kingdom, right? And he went to war with his father and he prevailed over his father and kicked the father out of the kingdom. And the Bible says that David ran to a particular location and hid himself there with his soldiers. And while they're hiding in some place with his soldiers, David is approached by his general named Joab. And Joab gets to learn that Absalom was visiting and he then wants to go to war with Absalom so that they can take over the kingdom and restore the kingdom into the hands of David. Are we still together? The Bible tells us about this particular war and this whole story begins with this war. It tells us that as the soldiers were leaving the camp of David, going to war, Job being the, being the general and Itai being another general and there, there were three generals that were there. The Bible tells us that David instructs the generals and says, when you get to battle, be kind to the young man Absalom. Be kind to the young man Absalom. The Bible says that other soldiers were passing by and they overheard the instructions of the king, be kind to the young man Absalom. So that we can begin to learn from that, beloved friends, that regardless of the things that people do to us, we ought to be kind to them. David says, be kind to Absalom for my sake. And sometimes you need to forgive people, not for your own sake, but for the sake of Jesus. And so David says, be kind to the young man Absalom for my sake. And the soldiers hear what is happening. They go to war. They get to the plain of Jordan and they begin their battle. The Bible tells us that in the heat of the war, Absalom was riding on his horse. And while Absalom is riding on his horse, I can just imagine this beautiful brother. His hair was just, you know, flowing because the wind was just blowing through his hair. The Bible says this man was riding this horse and was going through the fields. While he was going through the fields, the Bible says that his own hair was hooked to the oak tree. And the horse, the horse that he was riding continued moving and he was left hanging between heaven and earth. Are you following the story? Absalom is seen hanging between heaven and earth. One of David's soldiers sees Absalom hanging between heaven and earth and runs to Job to deliver a message. I have seen the king's son hanging between heaven and earth. And Job says to him, but why have you not killed the man? And he says, I am afraid to touch the son of the king because I overheard when you are giving instructions to be kind to the young man. The Bible says Job then decided to take three javelins and some soldiers who were his armor bearers and they went to where Absalom was and they struck three javelins into his heart. And the, the armor bearers started to beat up Absalom until they killed the king's son. Are you still following the story? 
Somewhere when you keep reading this story, after the king's son had died, the Bible tells us that after the king's son had died, um, Job himself blows the trumpet to let everybody know that the battle is over. The war has ended. I'm told that those who were in the camp of Absalom ran back home and those that uh, were with David's soldiers and Job came and gathered together. When they gathered together, lo and behold, the Bible tells us here that there was a young man called Ahimas that comes to Job and says to Job, Job, please allow me to run to the king to deliver the good news. And then the Bible tells us that, that Job then says to the young man, you have no news to deliver today. You have no news to deliver today because the king's son has died. But then the Bible says, and Job called a Cushite and says to the Cushite, go and tell the king what you have seen. This is where I need you to think a little bit. The idea of being sent and being called is very critical and important in the Bible. When you begin to think about being called and being sent, you begin to, to, to realize that both being called and being sent have a relationship. There can never be a sending dismissal where there is no calling. There is no way that you can go wherever you want to go if you are not called to go there. Both these two things have a relationship. I'm, I'm going to use a little bit of scientific language to illustrate this point. The idea of, of being sent and the relationship between these two things, there's a phrase that is found in physics. We call that the centripetal force of attraction. In physics, there's this force, there's this principle known as the centripetal force of attraction. The centripetal force of attraction simply means that it moves whatever that is on the peripheral side to the epicenter. Are you still following? Whatever that is outside is being dragged and drawn to the epicenter just like gravity works. Whatever is external is being called to come to the very epicenter. When you read into the New Testament, we find this principle throughout the entire New Testament. Because Jesus, when he starts his ministry, the Bible describes Jesus to us like this centripetal force of attraction. Jesus says somewhere in the New Testament, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. When Jesus is lifted up, a lot of people are drawn to the epicenter from the peripheral, whether it's geography or social statuses, they are drawn to Jesus Christ. Please say amen to that one. They are drawn to Jesus Christ and we begin to see disciples and all kinds of people coming to the epicenter, coming to Jesus Christ, coming from, from Galilee, coming to Jesus Christ. Different people, tax collectors, fishermen, everybody was being drawn to this man called Jesus Christ. And we begin to see Jesus calling all these people. And you will remember that Jesus did call the disciples. Before you even get to Jesus sending the disciples, he calls the disciples. Because there cannot be a sending dismissal without a centripetal force of attraction. He must call you first before he sends you. And the main question we need to ask you this evening is, are you called to the mission? Have you been called to the mission? Or like Ahimas, you are not called but you want to go. Might I just remind you, beloved friends, that they were called by Jesus. They came to Jesus. And when they came to Jesus, they came for two things, to be informed and to be transformed. They came to be informed and to be transformed. And after they were informed, they were taught by Jesus for about three and a half years. They were taught by Jesus. They came to Jesus as disciples to sit at his feet, to learn from Jesus and for their lives to be transformed. But after their lives were transformed, the Bible tells us that this whole phase culminates with Jesus dying on the cross. When Jesus resurrects on the cross, he does not call them disciples. 
follow, I, I, hope you, I hope you read your Bibles, right? He does not call them disciples. The Bible says he called them to Galilee. And when he was being lifted up, he says, from this day onwards, you shall be my witnesses. You shall go and preach the gospel. Take note that he had called them to the epicenter. Now that they've been transformed and they've been informed, he moves them from the epicenter back to the periphery itself. This force that attracts is the centripetal force of attraction. But then there's what we call the centrifugal force of expulsion. Which is the force that does not attract but sends you out. The Holy Spirit that we sang about earlier on is seen in the New Testament as that force. Jesus calls you in for information and transformation. The Holy Spirit then sends you out to go and preach the gospel. Not to go and deliver information, but to go and become witnesses. Take note how Jesus says to the disciples, tarry in Jerusalem. Remain in Jerusalem. Remain in the epicenter until the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And might I just tell you, beloved friends, do not go out to be a witness without the Holy Spirit. Do not go out. Do not leave Jerusalem without the Holy Spirit. But let me just add a second thing. There are some of us who just want to sit at the feet of Jesus the whole day. The 20 years you've been baptized, you are still at the feet of Jesus. You are, there. You are just there. During song service, you take it personal. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. You, you, you take this very personal. You, you must see us during song service, when, especially when we sing Chief of Sinners. Oh, we love that one. As if being a Chief of Sinners is something to be proud of. Oh, Chief of Sinners. Hey, Barcelona. Because we always want to sit at the feet of Jesus. We don't want to move. It is only disciples that must still learn. That must sit at the feet of Jesus to learn. But at some point, the Holy Spirit must come upon you and you must go and witness. But I must tell you, do not go out until you have the Holy Spirit with you. So I'm told here in the story, if you go back to the text that we read earlier on, we find this man, Ahimas, coming to Job and saying to Job, allow me to go and tell the king the good news. And the Bible says uh, that Job told the man, you do not have any news today. You do, never, you do not have any news because the king's son has died. But then the Bible says he then calls a Cushite and says to the Cushite, go and tell the king what you saw. You missed it. You missed it. Ahimas was not present, did not witness Absalom dying. But the Cushite saw Absalom being killed. He saw the king's son dying. Ahimaaz comes to Job and says, let me run and deliver the news. And Job says, you don't know anything. Remain here because you don't have a message. But he says to the Cushite, you have witnessed the death of the son. You go and deliver the news. Because the one who will receive the message is not interested in what you heard. He's interested in what you have seen. It's not about the information you know. It's about the witness, the testimony. Because disciples give information, but witnesses give testimonies. You can separate, you can separate a messenger from the message, but you can never separate a witness from the testimony. When you are a messenger, the mission will survive without you. Never think of yourself so important that the mission will suffer without you. We can do without you. But we cannot do without your testimony. We, 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 we can't tell your testimony. You are the only one that is a witness enough to tell your own testimony. So the Bible says that, that the Kushite started... 
Ah, oh, please take note, take note. Job says to the Cushite, go. But this one comes to Job and says, please allow me to run. <laughs> the Cushite was sent. The messenger Ahimas was not sent. He was permitted. He was not sent. He, he, he had permission not to go. He asked for permission to run. This one was sent to go. What's the story? The Bible says the Kushite started going to deliver the message. But Ahimas came to Job again. Job, Job, please, Job, Job. Allow me to run and deliver the news. And Job says, young man, relax. You have no message. You are not there. You did not witness the son, the son of the king dying. But the Bible says he kept pestering on Job. And Job says, you can run. And he permits him to run. The man bolted. The Bible says he ran with such speed. He was, he was such a qualified runner that the Bible says he was light on his feet. Through the plains, Ahimas was running. Whether it was descending or ascending, he maintained the same velocity. The man was moving. That the Bible says he even passed the Kushite on the way. He passes the Kushite and lo and behold in the kingdom, the watchman watches and he says, lo and behold, I see a man running. He, he was running. This man was running. The Bible says when they looked again, the watchman says, the one that is running runs like Ahimas. He was known as a sprinter. The Bible says, because he was running alone, the king says, if he's running alone, he must be carrying good news. And Ahimaaz is approaching. He's coming towards the kingdom, towards where the king is. The watchman then says, wait and wait. Behold, I see a second man also running. But then the Bible does not identify who he is. But they see him coming. When Ahimas arrives, he says, Hail, O king! Hail, O king! Lo and behold, we are victorious. We have won the battle. And the Bible says, The king said nothing and said, How does it fare with the young man Absalom? <laughs> Ahimas. <laughs> He says, I don't know. Read the verse. <laughs> After running so fast, and then you arrive, they ask you, how is it with the young man? He says, I don't know. I, I read the verse. He says, I just saw confusion. I just saw confusion. And the Bible says, they said to him, just stand aside. We will hear what the second one has to say. Let me pause and ask you, could it be, could it be that that because some of us are not called and we're permitted to run, the speed we use to run is an indicator of what we are carrying. Could it be that the swiftness and the quickness we want to use to go out there before we are informed, before we receive the Holy Spirit, helps us understand that you don't have substance, you have nothing. Simply going out there with information is carrying absolutely nothing. You're not carrying anything. Because a message is just a report that was constructed. But you need to have a personal testimony. You must have witnessed it. And so the Bible tells us that the Kushite finally arrived. And when he arrived there, he said to the king, Hail, O king. Hail, O king. The Lord has delivered your enemies into your hands. The king is not interested in the victory. He asks the Kushite, how does it fare 
with the young man Absalom. Let me add the second point. I'm moving towards the close. The second point of this message is this, that the content of the message is not the victory of the battle. The content of the message is what happened to the son. When you talk about the gospel, when you talk about as Adventist young people, the Advent message to all, my, to all the world in my generation, the content of that message is what do you know about the son of the king? That's the content of the message. It is not about going there and preaching protocol. It is about preaching about the son of the king. You, you can't go and tell everybody how when you get to church, this is how you must sit. This is where the chairs must be. They are not interested in that. They want the son of the king. How does it fare with the son of the king? And you must have experienced Jesus for yourself to talk about Jesus. We've been telling you about grace. It is high time that when you have experienced the grace of God, you must go and share that grace with others. And say, I was a sinner and I came to this Jesus. And this Jesus handled me with care. It's your testimony. It's your testimony. You, you can't sit there the whole day. Ah, oh, well, every day. You are reading, you are reading. You are reading. Every... No, no, there's nothing wrong with reading. There's nothing wrong with reading. But there's a time for everything. You are reading, man. Every day. Then you get inspired. Then you go and open a WhatsApp group. And in the WhatsApp group, you go and copy a sermon, a clip, two minutes of a sermon, and you post in the group to debate with friends and say, this one, this is not the end time message. This one, it's not the end time message. Look at how he's dressed. Look at how she's wearing. Look at how they're singing. Look at their hairstyles. They are not interested in that. They want to know. If we were to ask, what do you know about the son of the king? That's what we want to know. And might I remind you that a church without Jesus is a dangerous church. We have to have Jesus who is the epicenter himself. We have to know something about Jesus. Let me rush towards a conclusion. The Bible says that he got there and he delivered. He was asked, how did it go with the young man? And he says, oh king, may what happened to the young man Absalom happen to all your enemies. I, I don't have time. I, I wish I could talk about the text that the young man uses to deliver the message. You, you don't just deliver. I know, feel he's dead. Hey, he's dead. He could have. He could have done that. He could have just said he's dead. That one, forget him, he's dead. We are king, we are talking about victory here. No, he didn't talk. There was text to the delivery of the message. In this day and age, we have the word of the Lord. You, you know, if ever there's a generation that has the word of the Lord, it's our generation. We have the word of the Lord. We have it. It's in our Bibles. It's in our iPads. It's on our phones. It's in our cars. It's on CDs. It's online. We have access to the word. We have no excuses. We have no excuses of not knowing the son. Let me come to a close. The Bible says that he says to the king that may what happened to your son happen to all your enemies. And then he says, or oh, the, the, the Bible closes by telling us that the young man died hanging between heaven and earth. And it says, Ahimas, you have no message for the son of the king has died. I've come to remind you, beloved friends, that the son of the king has died. Jesus was seen hanging between heaven and earth. The story of Absalom is a prototype. It's a, it's a prefiguration. It's a, it's a picture. It's the antitype of the one who was to come. It's a picture of the son of the king that also hung between heaven and earth. 
the king's son is dead. We can't close. You know how it is. We can't close until we acknowledge this Jesus. And this evening, we want people that are willing to be witnesses. We want people that are, look, you, you, you have to find yourself. Find yourself. Find yourself. You, you cannot be a young person that's, that comes to church and leaves, comes and leaves, and, and you have not found yourself. At least tell us, pastor, I'm still a disciple. At least we know you are going somewhere. But find your place. Can I see the hands of those who are not baptized? Because everyone who's not baptized is still a disciple. Just please, I'm, I'm not asking you to stand. I just want to see who's not baptized. You are all baptized. Are you all baptized? You are all baptized. Don't lie to the pastor now. You are all baptized. All right. Anyone who's not baptized this side. There are a few of you who are not baptized. The rest of us would be baptized. Those are the only people that ought to be disciples. The rest of us in here ought to be witnesses. You have been chosen for the mission. All of us here who are witnesses, I understand that they still have to learn. They still have to sit at the feet of Jesus. And, but the rest of us, we have to be witnesses. What is your story? Your story. What's, what's your testimony? What have you seen? What have you seen? Is there someone who wants to say, Lord, help me to find my story. Help me to have my own experience. I know that I am baptized. Maybe I'm not sure. I was baptized, yes, but I got baptized. Then I sat down like a disciple and I just kept reading and reading. But, but I want to be a witness. I want an experience with you so that I can go out there and witness. Is there someone who wants to be a witness? Please stand if you want to be a witness. If, if, you, want, if you are saying to the Lord, give me a story. Give me an experience so that I can become a witness out there. These are the people that are chosen for mission. And I want to thank you for standing and standing for the mission of the Lord. We are going to pray with all humility. May I ask the pastor to come and pray for the saints as we prepare ourselves to become witnesses in this world. We want to thank God for that wonderful message. And even as we are praying, I was moved when the pastor said that there are some who have not been baptized. Obviously, we're not in a space where we force people, but the greatest decision that you can ever make is choosing to be baptized. It is evidenced by the majority of people who are here who want to be baptized. So even as we are praying, we want you to start thinking about baptism. Amen. We need you to start thinking about it. Uh, there's a word which says the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And I can assure you, that the decision to choose Christ is never a mistake. So may God bless you as we pray and as we encourage each other in prayer. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, tonight we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your love. We thank you, Father, because we are confident that your word cannot go forth and come back empty-handed. And so, Father, as we stand in your presence even tonight, we pray that may your spirit continue speaking to us. Father, we thank you for using your manservant to extract unf unfamiliar concepts from a familiar passage of scripture. That Lord, Absalom becomes or is a type of Christ who hung between the heavens and the earth. But we also want to thank you, Father, that the contrast between the two men has humbled us and made us realize that so many times we have run as mere messengers without a message, without a testimony. And so we have gloried in our technique and in our ability to run, and not only to run, but to outrun those who are witnesses. Father, may you rebuke us for this presumptuous position that we've had. So Father, this evening or tonight, we want to thank you for those who are standing up and who are saying, Lord, give us a story. Give us a testimony that we may become witnesses. Thank you for reminding us 
that the mission cannot do without, we will, without witnesses. And may we never be in that space where the mission will say to us, you are just messengers. We can do without you. And Father, I also want to extend this call to those who have not yet made a decision to be baptized. I know that there are others among this group who have made that decision. May you strengthen them. But may, may these men and women who are standing before you be an encouragement to that person who has not made that decision. And so, Father, we pray for your manservant, whom you have used tonight. May you bless him. Continue to give him strength. And the speakers who are speaking here, Pastor Zunguna and Hamwene, may you continue to give them uh, strength and the utterances that come from divinity itself. As we are going to rest, may you agitate our minds to, to not find rest until we become filled with your presence. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.